Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Real Life Church Online. I'm Pastor Bob, and I'm leading us this morning as we continue in our series looking at the book of 1 Peter. Now, before I get there, there's a couple announcements I want to give you. The very first one, and this is important, if you've got a smartphone right now, or you're watching on your iPhone, or your, your iPad, or your computer, this is what I want you to do. Very simple. I want you to like this page. I want you to go to our Facebook page. I want you to go to YouTube. I want you to be able to go to church online, whatever platform you're working on. And I want you to share that one with your friends and hashtag us Real Life Yuma. All right, we're trying to get our name out. We've just recently changed our name. And this is one way of being able to get this name change out to so many people that live in our community. Now, this is gonna be a regular part of our process every single week. We want you to like it, and we want you to share it with your friends because we believe what we're talking about is practical, it's applicable, and most importantly, it comes right from the Bible. Will you do that for me? I would appreciate that. I'm gonna wait five seconds for you to do that. All right, one, two, three, are you doing it? Don't lie, four, five. Now, if you did it, I say thank you, okay? If you didn't do it, man, you're exactly what I was talking about last week. And speaking of last week, that was a hot topic. And if you missed it, I want you to go back right now and watch that one because it kind of bleeds right into what we're talking about. Now, the second announcement I got for you, we're making a major change in the way we're doing what we call Vacation Bible School here at Real Life Church. Instead of doing it throughout the day, we're gonna switch to an evening format starting at 5.30, I believe, and I might get that wrong, I believe it's five o'clock. Five o'clock to 8.30, starting June 28th. The best way you can get information on that is go to our website. You know what it is? RealLifeYuma.com. Now, if you happen to go to oasischurch.com, that's okay too. It'll redirect you. But our new website is reallifeyuma.com. Now, like I said, last week, pretty hot topic, okay? Being subject, uh, being dual citizenship, being a part of this world, and being a part of God's kingdom, and our response on how we ought to respond to this world and its government and authority. Whew! Man, I'll tell you what, I was sweating for three weeks prior to that message. But now, we're moving on to a different area. But the same idea of being subject or submissive. So let's jump right into the passage. Let's see where God wants to take us this morning. Now, if you're a parent, you've probably heard your kids complain that that's not fair. And you probably responded with, well, life isn't fair. See, we are born, or I guess we have this strong sense of wanting things to be fair. We have a desire to stand up for ourselves when we're being treated unfairly. And we know that life isn't fair. And even though it's not fair, we still wanna fight back, especially when we're the victim and we're being treated unfairly. Well, let's just kind of play this out for a second before we get into the scripture verses. Let's just assume you're conscientious. You're, you're great at your job. You get to work early. You're careful about not extending that lunch hour more than it's supposed to be. You sometimes even stay late to accomplish whatever it is that needs to be accomplished, um, even though you're on overtime and you're working for free. You're careful not to waste company time. You don't get involved in excessive spending. You're not wasting time with chit chat. You work hard and you produce for your company. And because you're a Christian, you don't necessarily go out drinking every night with the boys and you don't necessarily swap you know, jokes with them. You actually do a good job. And yet there's that other guy or that other lady who's what you would consider as a goof off, okay? They come in late and you end up you know, picking up the slack for them not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They go out drinking every night with the boss and they listen to the new joke and, and the boss laughs at everything that they say and they do. And when the promotion opens up, the chance for advancement in the company, guess who gets overlooked? You do. Life isn't fair. Important, right? How do you respond when life isn't fair? More importantly, how should you respond 
when life isn't fair. Is it wrong to defend yourself or to stand up for your rights? How should a Christian respond when they're treated unfairly, especially in the workplace? Well, that's a great question. And it's a question I hope that Peter will help us address this morning. My guess, you're probably not gonna like the answer, and I know why. Because I don't really like the answer either. But it doesn't change the fact that it is God's word, okay? And we are given God's word to guide, direct, and we're to be obedient as Christians. So let's see what it says. We're gonna pick up right there in verse 18, right where we left off last week. We did 13 through 17, and now we're gonna go on verses 18 through 25 of chapter two, all right? Why don't you read along with me? Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, by the way, that's easy, right? The good and gentle masters, but to those who are harsh. Yep, that's the tough one right there. Verse 19, it says, for this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person endures grief when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if you sin and are harshly treated? You endure it with patience. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it. Why? Because this finds favor with God. Verse 21, for you've been called for this purpose because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you would follow in his steps. Now that's gonna be important here in a few seconds. Verse 22, he says, he who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being abusively insulted, he did not insult in return while suffering. He did not threaten, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Sounds like an example for us, huh? Verse 24, and he himself brought our sins in his body up on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. So that's verses 18 through 25. Again, um, like seven or eight verses there. Um, what really stands out to you when you read that? Now, there are several things that I'm looking at. And the first one is this idea of the word servants. And actually, the, the real word, uh, if you go back into the original language, it means slave. Um, the, the lowest form of slavery, what we would call a household slave. In the first century, the gospel was spreading through every class of individuals. And, and, and back then, the vast majority of Christians even had slaves. The Roman Empire, it is said, are you ready for this, that there was at least 60 million slaves at the time Peter was writing this epistle. They come from all different parts of the world. It wasn't necessarily based on skin color or social economic status. It was based on whoever Rome was conquering at that time. They would conquer an area or a country and they would take those people into slavery. Many of them were government workers. They were doctors or lawyers or teachers in their former country, military people, and now they were forced to be servants to the Roman citizens. The word slave here, again, is a domestic type of slave. It is one of the most degrading and lower forms of servanthood out there. That type of slave had to be at the beck and call um, of their master at all times. They were forced to clean, cook, and do many other degrading types of things in the Roman Empire. Yes, there were slaves back then. It's hard for us to comprehend, but these slaves were treated like animals. They were branded. They legally had no rights. They weren't allowed to marry. They cohabitated. They had children. And those children became property of the masters. And the masters actually had the, the right of life and death over them. They were treated like criminals and they were harshly treated. And often those slaves became militant they became bitter and they revolted against those that were in charge. And this is where Peter writes to those Christians who were slaves and how they ought to respond to those masters, 
those that were in charge? Peter answers that question, okay? So let's kind of go back and, and just recapture very quickly what he said, and then let's break it into our culture because really, is this applicable today? Could we have just actually just skip this whole passage because really, do we have servants and masters today? Maybe more so than you think. Well, the very first thing Peter says, and um, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. It's, it's that same word that keeps coming up over and over. Be subject, be submissive, which means to take a place underneath someone else who's under or over charge of you. They were to, are you ready for this? Those slaves were to submit to their human masters even when those human masters were treating them unfairly. Now, let me tell you something. Servants, slaves, whatever we're gonna say this morning, were never to lie, they were never to steal, they were never to cheat, they were never to murder, they were never to do anything that would, if you wanna call it, transgress the moral law of God in order to please their masters. Being under submission or being subject to someone else doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with them. But it does mean is that you will voluntarily place yourself under their authority because they're in the position of authority. Paul, or in this case, Peter, did not just say submit to the masters that are nice and gentle, he also said to submit to the ones that were harsh and mean and unruly. Not only did he say that we were to be submissive to those type of masters, because when we do, it's pleasing to God. Now, let's stop for a second, because again, how does this kind of work for us today? We don't really have a, a slave and master, if you want to call it mentality, at least I hope we don't. But there are times that we do have that, those people that are in authority over us. I'm thinking about like when you go to work every day, um, you are under the authority of your employer and you're the employee. And we're supposed to submit ourselves even to the ones who treat us harshly as much as we submit ourselves and are subject to the ones that treat us nicely. Now, that's hard, isn't it? Because sometimes, like I said, you disagree. Now, it is our American way to disagree, right? But, and it is our way to stand up for our rights, right? Um, it, well, it might be the American way, but is it necessarily the biblical way? And this is what I'm going to kind of talk about. There's three questions I want you to ask ourselves. And if we're going to stand up and stand up for ourselves with an unhar or a harsh or, you know, unruly, you know, someone who's in authority over us, then the, the first question I have to ask myself is, has God ordained this sphere of authority? Um, that's a tough one to say. Has God ordained this? Has God actually placed this person over authority in me? And he does that because he says that in his scripture that he has all types of hierarchies. There's a hierarchy for government. There's a hierarchy for families. There's a hierarchy even in church where there are people that are in authority or ruling over or are the boss, whatever you want to say. And then there's the people that are subject to the boss or to the authority or to the employer. And now once we've identified, you know, is this a hierarchy that God has ordained or God has given? The question is, is do I have the proper attitude of submission? Ooh, that's a tough one, huh? Do, am, I, am I having the proper attitude of submission or am I selfishly fighting for my rights? or selfishly fighting for my way. Um, and if, uh, if I'm truly in submission, and if I'm acting out of my own selfish needs, then guess what? You, you're not doing what Peter said here. Our attitude and our motivation is me over submission to the authority that God has put there. Now, this brings up an interesting thing, and we kind of talked a little bit about that last week. 
What about, you know, Jesus? He was a good example of this. And there were times that Jesus, you know, when they questioned his authority and they questioned who he was, and um, he actually defended himself. Now, he didn't defend himself and jump up and down on tables and say, uh, I'm, I am who I am and you all, no, he didn't do that. He, he quietly defended himself. He, he confronted those that were accusing him with the truth. And yet at the same time, there are times in Jesus's life when, you know, they were um, hurling insults at him and they were accusing him of things that weren't true. And, and Jesus didn't say a word. And yet he was right. So there is a time and a place for us to stand up to authority or those, if you want to call it masters that are over us. And there's also a time to be kind of silent and be quiet. So is it a godly authority? What is my attitude? And here's the third thing, and this hasn't changed now in a couple of weeks. What is my witness to outsiders when I stand up for myself and stand up to this unruly authority? What are people seeing about me as I do that? Do they see you as a crusader? Do they see you as somebody who's just rebellious? Do they see somebody that won't submit to authority? No matter what it is. So Peter right here in the middle of this passage, he wants us to understand and he gives us an example starting in verse 21. He gives us the example of Christ. He says, in verse 21, it says, you've been called for this purpose because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you would follow in his steps. Life is not fair. And Jesus suffered. And by the way, so will you. There will be times when life is not fair, and yet we're, we're, we're commanded here by Peter to follow his example. Now, that's kind of hard, right? Because there's several places in the Bibles, I'm thinking like Philippians 3, that talks about that, that we would not might know Jesus and the power of his resurrection, and we probably forget this other part, and the fellowship of his, what? Suffering. See, we're supposed to follow his steps. Philippians 1, it says that we're not only to believe in Christ, but we're also to suffer for his sake. Now, um, suffering uh, for his sake, it, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense in, in our culture because that's just not really happening. Um, maybe on some minor ways, but really it's not happening like it is in third world countries in places where if you are a Christian and you decide to follow Christ, you know, you lose everything. Man, you can go to some phenomenal websites, themartyrs.com, and you can look at those, or, um, and, and you can see all kinds of different stories of that happening. We don't see that a lot of time, suffering for Jesus. But he is our example. And if he could suffer, then maybe we might have to suffer also. Now, Peter could have used lots of other people. He could have used himself, okay? Remember, he will suffer also the ultimate death. He will, by Nero's hands, be crucified upside down. And, you know, to our recollection and to our understanding, he did not utter threats. He just simply said, I cannot be crucified like Christ because I am not worthy of it. That sounds like somebody who understood what suffering was all about and that Christ was his example. Well, let's get practical. That's a great passage of scripture, okay? But let's get practical. Here's some things I want you to remember. Um, and, and at the end of that, I, I have, I think, a list of some do's and don'ts. And maybe you can, you know, maybe those are things that you can share. Hey, our pastor talked about, you know, um, uh, you know suffering, undo, you know, whatever it is that you're working. Here's, here's his list of do's and don'ts. Maybe you can share that with a friend. But before I do that, I just want to, I just want to remind you of this. What are, we, what are we to say when we're treated unfairly? There's been times in my life I've been treated unfairly. I know there's been times in your life as well. I want to remind you of something. Life isn't fair. It's not. And it's amazing that there's so many of us today, so many Christians that get upset when things don't come out even. Don't, don't you know that this world is stacked against us? Absolutely stacked against us. Whoever said life was fair? 
I'm not even, I'm not aware of anywhere in the Bible, you know, uh, that where it says that, you know, <laughs> life is fair. But I, I am aware of a lot of different places that says that God is ultimately the one who is going to judge. He will reign in the end. But right now, there are no guarantees. Life isn't fair. And in a fallen world like ours, man, mankind is corrupted. Uh, we have a sinful nature. Um, and, and I guess since God has allowed us to make choices, it, it only goes to show that life is not going to be fair. We need to remember that. And, and if, if, if you forget that, you might have some higher expectations of people. Life isn't fair. I know it bugs you, right? Okay, bugs me too. That the bad guy sometimes wins. Yep, the criminal gets off scot-free and the one who's innocent goes to jail. Yep, the, the ladder climbing, people who step on people's backs in order to be able to get to the penthouse. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that we can't do something about it, but what I'm saying, okay, is do what we can do. And at that point, remember that we have a sovereign God who sees everything and knows everything, and don't let your expectations be too high. No matter how you live or what you do, life is not going to be fair. Maybe that should have been the title of the message, I don't know. Now, the second thing I want you to remember, okay, life's not fair. Second thing, okay, whatever happens in you is far more important than what happens to you. Let me say that again. What happens in you is far more important than what happens to you. See, we're in the process, uh, those of us that are Christians, of becoming more like Christ. So what's happening inside of you? Are we being like Christ? Are we more concerned about what's happening to us? I mean, a lot of times it's, it's difficult, right? We keep relieving that unhappy moment or that unhappy experience and we devote hours to it, you know, appealing to the wrong verdict or the wrong doing in our mind. And, and you know what, if, if that's what you're concentrating on and if that's what's consuming you, you're going to be miserable. Okay. Can I say that? I'm just being, I'm being honest with you because see, sometimes in the courtroom of our mind, we keep trying that case over and over and over and really honestly, it's time just wasted. Even though we're sure the verdict is guilty, even though we're sure there's been no justice, life's not fair, okay? And God is more important about building your character than what's happening to you on the outside. Now, the, the, the third thing, okay, and really quickly, God is watching how you respond, okay? Guys, let me tell you this. There's more happening that's, that, that, that there's so much injustice being done, but God is watching to see how you will respond. Will you respond like Christ or will you respond like you? Okay, great question, right? Last thing I wanna say before I get to my really quick list, all right? Don't get bitter. Man, it's so easy to get bitter. And I'm gonna tell you something, bitterness, if you read in the Bible, leads to so many different bad things in our life. Don't allow life to get you bitter. Now, I got these do's and don'ts, okay? And I wanna share these with you. Maybe you can tweet them out. I don't know, maybe you can put them in the chat, whatever it is that you wanna do. Maybe just write them down, okay? Now, first of all, this is a do. Do put God first in everything and he says that he has our back. That's pretty good, by the way. Do put God first. Keep God first in whatever situation you find yourself in and God's got your back. Man, I'll tell you what, I, I know some people that said they got my back, um, but um, when God says, you know, we honor him first and foremost, he'll take care of us. You can find that all over scripture. Second thing, it's a don't, okay? Don't take out personal vengeance. Man, that's, that's gonna get you in trouble. A vengeance isn't ours, okay? If we believe that we have a sovereign God who's in charge of everything, let God take whatever judgment and vengeance is necessary. Third one, it's a do. Pray for the person and your Christian response towards that person. You know, sometimes we get so mad and so angry, and you know the best way to change that mad? Begin to pray for them and pray 
that God changes your heart, okay? That's so good. Don't approach the situation demanding, okay? Man, it's so much like us wanting to get our way. Well, I'm, I'm gonna change this situation and they, they're not gonna treat me unfairly and I'm not gonna put up with that. And so you're gonna make this list of demands and what you're gonna end up doing is not be like Christ, okay? We wanna be careful about that. And everything that we do, everything that we do, here's the do, do it in love. I know, I, I know. I know what you're thinking right now, sure. I'll love the guy that's treating me, you know, horrible. Yes, that's what I'm exactly asking you to do. I said this a couple weeks ago, don't you realize that every single person on earth, whether you agree with this or not, has been created in the image of God and God created them? You realize that, right? We don't have the right to hate somebody. Now, we have to learn to love them, okay? And that's hard because people have done some horrible things to each other and I'm telling you that we need to learn to love them just like God loves you, all right? Well, let me follow it up with another don't. Don't whine and don't complain. Isn't that so, you know, that uh, it's, it, it kind of goes along with my other don't that's coming up. Matter of fact, I'll just share it with you. Don't gossip. Don't whine, don't complain, and don't gossip. It's so easy to try to go out there and get people to understand your side of the story, get everybody on your, you know, your side of, uh, don't, okay? Don't whine, don't, I don't remember, I'll have to look this up in my Bible, but I don't remember Jesus whining, okay? I don't even remember him complaining. I mean, he certainly didn't gossip. Okay, so one of the do's, okay? And this is, this is one of those hard ones. Do apologize if, if, and make amends if necessary, okay? And I know that sometimes you always think that you're right and I always think that I'm right, okay? But sometimes we mess up, I mess up. Okay, and sometimes I, I know I have to go back and apologize for what I said, what I did, what I didn't do, whatever it is, and make amends. Now, I already said don't gossip, so we'll skip that. Um, but um, here's the last one I wanna to talk to you about. Don't do whatever you're about to do in public, okay? Because a lot of times when you back people into corners in public, you're gonna be surprised at what comes out, okay? Now that is probably, I think, some pretty good stuff for us to take home, all right? I would encourage you to share those, okay? Because I think those make sense. Challenging passage of scripture, okay? So I'm coming next week, all right? We're gonna take a break in the book of 1 Peter. Matter of fact, I'm telling you, uh, we, I, I get to preach a message that's not on any agenda. Um, it's not a, uh, from first Peter, it's not a topical, it's what I call a free Sunday. And you know what, I, th I'm, I think I'm gonna talk about, it's Memorial Day weekend and I'm gonna talk about people, okay? I think I'm gonna talk about people next week and I wanna invite you to come back, all right? So I hope you did what I asked you to do. Let me remind you one more time to share this video, to like the video, hashtag the video, whatever you can do to help us get the word out there, all right? Let me pray and then I will see you back next week online. God, thank you for our morning. Thank you for the challenging piece of scripture. Lord, we are all subject to someone else, whether it's a work environment, Father, whether it's a husband-wife relationship, whether it's a parent-child relationship, we all find ourselves underneath authority and sometimes we find ourselves in authority. Lord, we never even addressed that today. For those of us that find ourselves in authority, how we should treat those that are underneath us. But Lord, maybe we'll save that for another day. God, I pray that you've spoken to our hearts. I pray, Father, that you, you'll help us to make sense of this. And I pray, God, that you'll use this in your word to help us become more like you. God, you are good and worthy to be praised. And it is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, God bless you guys, and I'll see you back next week.